That's so yeah. cool. Now, yeah. now on, on a gig like that, okay, of that caliber, I mean, and, and all of them, okay, like the Paul Anka gig you were reading and, mm -hmm. and everything like mm -hmm. that. What's the, and you talked about the learning curve. W what is a learning curve and how do you go about learning a catalog like, you know, Pink Floyd? How do you, how do you do that? Because I'm assuming you're not reading that gig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one thing I learned um, kind of early on was that if I wrote charts out for everything, then I'd be stuck on the chart. Right, you're married to it. You get married yeah. to the chart, you get very, you rely on it a lot. Yeah. And, and I became kind of a creature of habit of that. And, I, and so I sing, so I thought, you know what I'll do is I'll write the lyrics out, and any notes I need to make, I'll write in the margins. Oh, wow. So That's I'll write the idea. tempo, and then I'll write, like, this is the groove, and I might write, like, two bar groove pattern. Well, you'll draw out the groove, what it is. Yeah, yeah. just to remind myself of right. what the pattern is. And then if there's like a little lift in the bridge or an edit, you know, extra 16 bars in the middle or some of the solo or something like that. So that's what I ended up doing. And it really helped because, you know, um, if an artist, I've never had this problem with an artist. You know, we don't want you reading on the, sta on the bandstand, no music stands. Right. Like Frank Zappa, no music stands. Right. That, yeah. I mean, boy, yeah. can you imagine? Oh my, no, <laughs> I can't. I, no, I, no, I can't. So I studied with Ralph Humphrey. Oh yeah. And years ago. Sure. And, and, and he told me that he was like, yeah, you couldn't read anything and yeah. it was really hard. Right. So anyway, sorry. Didn't no, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And, um, so anyway, um, as far as answer your question, so like with the Floyd stuff or any, any of this music um actually interestingly interestingly enough i was never given a set list of tape or anything from them for the for david's tour really? except for the, and, and i was i didn't even get his new album because sony was supposed, supposed to send me the record i never got it so i don't even have i had no new material <laughs> you never even heard it no really well, i think they were playing the, the single on the radio on an island and i was like okay i was like, like i heard that one. Oh yeah so yeah. i was like okay i kind of know that but so I just kind of went, well, what songs did David write? What songs did David sing? Let me look at his back catalog. What are his solo albums? So I went, I wrote a list, and I went down that list, and I, and I just kind of started listening a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And you shedded them a lot too. Um, yeah, a little. I mean, I I played some of the feels, but I most mostly what I do is listen. Yeah. You know, it's it's almost like I I prefer to get there and play with the musicians. And then see what that feels like right. instead of just trying to play and play because if, I've, I've done really that a little bit, but okay. and again I, I got the lyric sheets and I and I didn't one good thing about having a lyric sheet too is when you're rehearsing things will change. So yeah. if you're writing a chart out note for note from the record, mm -hmm. it's nine times out of ten it's not going to be like live. Right, right. It might be close, but they say hey you know what we're going to break it down and we're going to do this vamp and then we're going to go into this other thing. We might modulate. Right. Whatever, right. and make mood, so then you can make, make your musical notes. Okay, and I, so I keep a pretty open palette for that. Right, and it, it seems to work. But as far as learning curve, yeah, I think on any gig, any playing with new players, there's always that um, time period where you're there's an adjustment period, and, and, and players are feeling each other out, and and you know, so it's 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 a really good feeling. Yeah, because it keeps things fresh and makes you like kind of, you know, because it's exciting. Oh yeah, I can imagine. I mean, you know, you know yeah. Like for example, um, I've been playing um, with this Night Train Music Club every once in a while. It's going to be Steve Postel, and it's up at the Buffalo Club, in Santa Monica. And Steve gathers really amazing players from LA and all around um, on any given Wednesday night. And I've been, been fortunate enough to do two of these. Well, this last Wednesday, two nights ago, I played with Alfonso Johnson, oh Danny God. Korchmore, uh, Jeff Young, who plays with Sting and yeah. Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, um, anyway, it was just a fantastic, Steve Postel, and it was just a fantastic band. And, you know, I've, I've done a couple sessions with Danny, but the pedigree of these guys, like Alfonso Johnson played in Weather Report. Yeah. And I, I mean, I used to listen to him with Billy Cobham, and I mean, so um, now I'm sitting down on drums and he's sitting there, standing there and I'm going, <laughs> and he's the nicest guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, so I don't want to say nervous, but there's an excitement like, wow, yeah. I get to play with this guy tonight and I want to do well and all that stuff. So it keeps you on your toes. It keeps you on your toes. Yeah. So, and it was a blast. 
And is that gig? Are you reading that gig, or are you just kind of? Oh, you so it's funny. They all have chart. They all have books except for the drummer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I'm asking Alfonso, is there a char is there any charge for the drummer? He says, Nah, you don't need it. And it, again, it, it, sure enough, it was like this is how the groove goes. They'll turn around, say four on the floor, boom, doom, 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 and you're okay. Two, three, <laughs> kick out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, yeah, We've yeah, all yeah, done yeah. that. Yeah. And then you just use your instincts. And Man, that's so cool. It's man. really fun. That's so that, really so cool. yeah, I mean, you know, it's always fun to play with new players. Oh yeah. And, uh, um, even players that you work with a lot, you know, it's that's also a joy because you really, as you know, being in a band, being yeah. in several bands, you develop your camaraderie and you oh, really yeah. get tight. Oh, you do, you, you do, know? yeah. And I, I'm sure, like, okay, when you're talking, let's let, the Gilmore thing. I don't want to just stay on the Gilmore thing, but I mean, you know, who, who, <laughs> yeah, what, what's he doing? I mean, that band, I mean, from the get-go, it's got to be pretty, I mean, from day one, it's got to be pretty tight, but I'm, sh I'm sure as the tour goes on and things, Absolutely. it just, like, it does. gels like crazy. It does. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, David's great, because he is a, he's just a real player, and he, you know, he just gets and plays the guitar and just wants to have a good time and he really key on each other and just play music. And are you are you playing to a click on that gig? Uh, I reference a click on a few tunes. Okay, but not the whole show. Not the whole show. No, no. Because um, the songs, Joe Hardy, our mutual friend Joe Hardy and uh, I were talking about that the other night, and the songs are so slow. They're deliberate. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's. It, Playing slow is hard. I'd rather play a barn burner any day of right, the week. Right, amen, you know, amen. You know, but when you're trying to play slow and hold it together, that's that's got to be a big challenge. It is. And you know, the, <coughs> I use that as a reference mainly because when you're playing, let's say you're playing a tune and you get to the end and you know, when you're playing and you're doing the big thing at the end and the yeah. big ending, and it's yeah, like right. you're playing an arena and it's the lights are going crazy. Bam, and you end it, and your heart's going bam, 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 because you're just like, yeah, ah. yeah, right? And then the next tune's going to be boom, 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 oh boom, boom. I need to re reference that and go, oh, that's right, that's where that is. And so I hear that, and I go, okay. And it just gives you a second to take a deep breath and re reference it, but I don't play it through the whole tune. Okay. I reference the beginning and bail on it. And you're done. With yeah. It. And, and you just hold on to that internally. Yeah. And the thing is with David, and he even encourages it, like if you listen to some of those Floyd tunes, like we do money. Okay. If you were to tempo map that from the beginning, it starts off. Right? By the ending, it's because it goes with the guitar. So and he wants it to just push and it's live it's like ah exciting yeah right. so for the most part i'd say 98 percent of that show is with that it was is just playing really okay. there's a couple tunes um that i reference just because i think it, it's synced to uh film and stuff like that right, right, right. but um other than that it's it's like the real thing so so at that okay with a gig like that and, mm -hmm. and with, with all the gigs mm -hmm. what's the pressure like is the is the pressure on on you big time do you feel it is it you know the only pressure i feel is for myself yeah okay and i get and, that. and i treat i really treat every gig the same mm -hmm. like i i try to come prepared i think if you're prepared and you show up and you're confident with what you're doing it's going to be cool yeah you know there's things that are out of your control that sometimes might be troublesome or, or frustrating or cost but that's usually like could be a technical issue whatever yeah but as far as like you mean external like pressure from like an organization or an artist yeah from the artist i mean you, like okay for instance let's say you know you you did um You've done a lot of stuff where you're being filmed for DVD releases right. or what have you, right? right? And it's it's one night, and it's live, <laughs> and you don't get a second chance. You can't. That's I, right. I can't choke. Yeah, you can't choke. <laughs> no. You know. I mean, do you right. ever feel that? Do you ever? I mean, it's, there there's not a point ever that you can go. I just wasn't feeling it tonight. You can't. Well, that doesn't happen. Not when you're filming, but you know, it's yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah, there's pressure there, of course. It's like you want to do well, and you want to represent well. And um, 
uh, David is like David never really puts pressure on you. He's the most mellow guy, and he he's just a really sweet guy. Um, so yeah, I mean the pressure usually comes from my own, but I don't put my I, I try not to put pressure on myself. The thing that gets kind of gets me going, and I know it's the same for you when you play with in front of a lot of people. It's like I want to do well for these fans. Oh, totally. And they're yeah. expecting, especially a lot of those Pink Floyd tunes. They're expecting it to be like perfect. Yeah. So you know, I, I you know I, I take I try to take pride in that and just do it the best I can. That's all you can do. Yeah, it's right. The best you can. And yeah. you know, I, I kind of give a lot away. I, I don't I don't make it about me. So right. Much. I try yeah. not to make it about me. Right. And once That's I cool. once I not make it about me, and give it up to maybe a higher power or something mm -hmm. that's bigger than me. Right. I'm cool. That's like, all right, let's go do this. I know how to play. We, That's it. We vlog the hours. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And if there's a mistake, there's a mistake. It's, I mean, we're human beings. Right. And it's funny, too, because it's interesting. Audience, I've noticed that if there's a mistakes happen or train wrecks happen, audiences love it. Because they oh, feel yeah. like they're part of a moment. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're human after all. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know? And yeah. it's like, they, we were at that, remember when the thing went down and the da 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 da? Yeah. I mean, and, uh, and thanks to you, I don't have to worry about my bass drum breaking because of the, of the bass drum patch that you came up with, which is a genius idea. Well, I got to give credit where credit's due, and, and Chris brought this up the other day in, in Roy's video. That was actually the original idea from that came from my bass player, Greg Kasparian. We were playing uh, Nam Jam at, uh, um, yeah, it was not this last Nam, but the year before last. And we were playing with five other bands, and they were using my kit. And my bass player, Greg, comes up. He goes, man, what are you going to do if, like, somebody goes through your bass drum head? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, right. didn't really Oops. think about it until now. That's a, yeah. Yeah. And so he goes, and he goes, you ought to come up with something, you know, come up with an idea, you know, and, and make a patch for the bass drum head. Well, I, I was like, oh, yeah. Well, and I was walking off the stage to grab something out of one of my flight cases. And I was like, ding, that Duradot thing that, that Aquarian had thought of. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so the next day at NAM, we were at, uh, Chris Brady and I were at a Mike Johnston clinic, and he was talking about endorsements. And I go, hey, I want to run this idea past you. And I told him, he goes, hey, okay, and he went to Ron and Roy, and they dug it. So That's awesome. It's cool. such a great, it's genius. Well, it should have been done years ago. Well, hopefully we don't ever have to use it, right? I know, it happened <laughs> to me, well, it happened to me once. I went through it. It was the last tune on a Crosby, Crosby, Stills, and Nash show of the, really? first, of the first set. It was like we were playing Deja Vu or something. Yeah. And I go to the I go to the last sixteen bar and I went right through the head. You did. Yeah. And I was like, it's not good. The, the, the beater was stuck in the <laughs> it's thing. Stuck in the yeah. head. Yeah. And I'm like, no. So I'm playing the floor tom. Boom, bam, boom, boom. Did you really? Yeah. You play, you, yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're kind of like, what are you, what's happening back there? Um, and then of course we, we luckily it was the right before the interval. So right. They, they had to take the drum, you know, took it over there, changed it out. I remember, well, that's, I, I used to, I remember that's one reason why Jeff Picaro kind of came up with that rack. Because he, oh, yeah. if you had to change a bass drum out in the middle of the set, yeah. it wasn't, there wasn't toms and stuff. Toms and everything. So that's why he and J-Mo came up with that rack. Oh, really? Yeah. No kidding. I didn't his, know that. That was his idea. Really? Yep, yeah, because he was playing with Toto, and he had, he was all his stuff. He goes, and he, I guess he went through a bass drum head, same thing. They had to dismantle the kit. Oh yeah, because all the toms are attached and all mm -hmm. that. So he said, "Gee, why don't we make where well, the toms are separate and the cymbals are separate? We can just pull the bass drum out." And back then, those toms—I mean, you, you know—you're talking about it, you know the the concert toms yeah. back in the air, the power toms back yeah. in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, and you, so there's like a <laughs> zillion things bolted to the bass drum, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that, anyway, that's just, that's so that's brilliant. Man. Well, cool. I'm glad I'm, yeah, I'm glad we have a spare tire now, right? That's <laughs> so cool. Well, yeah. It's, that, yeah, that that's kind of, what it is. That I stuff, mean, kind of, that kind of stuff, really gives you peace of mind. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, it does. You know. So now, it, I, on another note, so you just got back. You you did a leg with Gilmore, mm -hmm. and you came out and you went out with Don Felder. Don Felder. Yeah. Now, how do you switch gears there? How do you go from how hard is that to switch gears from, you know, Gilmore to Don Felder? Not tough at all. I mean, it, it's. I I mean, I look at music. It's music. Mm -hmm. You know, and right. it's it's. 
and also, you know, we're doing a lot of eagle stuff, so that stuff's pretty much ingrained. Right, yeah. Um, and I've been doing the gig now for a while, but the switch gears is actually, I love it, because I feel fresh. Right. Yeah. Coming into it, it's like, oh yeah, let's do this stuff again. Yeah. And now I get to go back with David, it's like, all right, let's go play this music again. So, I mean, it's not, the only thing different, really, is my setup. Mm-hmm. Like what? How? What, what's a, what's? What well, with Dawn, I use uh, I use the one up, two down, kick, snare, one rack, two floor toms, ride, crash, crash, china, hat. Right. David Gilmore, I use 10, 12, 14, 18. Then I have uh, crash, ride, a lot of symbols on the right. You got roto toms. I got a foundry <laughs> bell over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this huge foundry bell, which is amazing, for uh, high hopes. And yeah, it's, it's a real division bell. It's uh, it's it was it was made in the foundry, and they make these things in the ground. They like make a mold of it and yeah. they pour the pour it in, and it's too, it's laid that f for a certain pitch. Really? Yeah, it's on this gigantic stand. I've seen pictures of it. Yeah, and, and, and I'll never forget the first time that happened. Uh, this is kind of a funny story. When I first went over to play with David the last time, like ten years ago, um, basically. I played Nick Mason's old kid. It was just there. So oh, really? Yeah, they don't even have to bring drums. Just come on over. <laughs> and Nick I, won't care. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was in the storage unit or something. Right. And I brought a snare and some cymbals or whatever. So it was basically a five piece kit. It was really? a kick, two toms, and a floor tom. Yeah. So we play, you know, and I'm getting comfortable. And then the next day, David says, let's try a time. Let's play time, breathe, you know. So Bill, his is guitar tech, roll, wheel out the roto toms. So then the roto toms show up and like where you want them, it, it's literally like that. So I'm thinking, so okay over here, they're and on your right. They're on my right. Okay. It's just because yeah, there's just too much stuff on the left side. I kind of prefer them on the left, but they're on the right side. Pull out the roto I, I flip around. So, and then we play, and then, then later like the next day, okay, we're gonna try high hopes. So, Phil, roll out the foundry bell, and this huge tr roll case comes out. It's like the size of a refrigerator. And they put, they, I'm like, what is, what's, what's coming now? <laughs> they take this thing off. It's this giant bell. And the stand is this big steel, like, stand. Right. It takes four guys to lift this bell. And they hook it on this, you know. To, How much is away? I don't know. Something. I've mean, I clocked my head on that, like, several times. Like an idiot. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> 40,000 people, boing, 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 boing. Fortunately, only in rehearsal. I really? Get, oh, yeah, I, I clocked myself on that thing a couple times. Like, I'd put my water down, I'd get, and I'd come up and go, wham. But anyway, so I had to figure out where that was going to go. We had to pick the right mallet for that. And somebody stole the mallet in the Royal Albert Hall, and we still haven't found it. So if anybody knows... If you were there... That, and it sounds funny, but the mallet... <laughs> Is a certain they're made in Switzerland. We had a font. We went through like twenty mallets to find the right one. Seriously? Yeah, it has to be the right weight, and then we had a leather bound on the end, so it's the perfect sound. Because we went through, we tried Delrin ones, we tried plastic, we tried really just the metal. The, you can't just hit it with a metal one, so we had it had a bound of leather, so we get the perfect attack. <laughs> they mic it from underneath. Yeah. And somebody stole stole the. Is know. it is it like is it really loud? I can't. I mean. Um, no, it's not really loud. I it's can't imagine this thick. I was, yeah. So you got to give it a good whack. Yeah. But it, with the leather, it's great. But it's it's pretty hard to get that thing perfectly consistent. So it's and it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a trip. It's a trip. So yeah. Anyway, so that, I thought it was a funny story with the whole the way the kit kept growing. This <laughs> it's like expanding as the tour goes. It, it is. And then this this last tour, I kind of got you know ambitious, and I'm like, I'm gonna put up a 22 in China, and I'm gonna add a sizzle, and <laughs> I think when I go back, I'm gonna add another. It's just you got a gong. You get a, oh man, that's a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> hey, you gotta have a gong, dude. Come on, you're playing with Gilmore. Yes. Don't even if you don't play it, yeah, you gotta have it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 I do I do prefer playing a smaller kit. Yeah. I, I actually feel more comfortable on a four piece. Oh yeah, it's like my favorite thing. Yeah, the simple setup, and because it just makes you focus on the groove. And, right. Um, I I use those toms and stuff um, for just for because some of those fills you have to. Oh yeah, you know, and you want more. Well, especially like time with the roto toms and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and also it just gives you a wider palette. And then when you hit that 18 floor tom, um, mm. but anyway, Don Felder, getting back to that, um, it was really it's been really fun because we've been doing shows with sticks. 
Oh, cool. And Todd Zuckerman. Todd, yeah. oh, Todd's a monster. He's dude. an unbelievable drummer, and he's the nicest guy, and we've been having so much fun out there. And I just, it's just a blast to watch him every night. And he is an amazing kid. He's a big giant. Yeah. But boy, can that guy play. And oh, he's he's monster. He's man. unbelievable. Yeah, he really is. So that's been really fun. And actually, last week, um, Kansas was on one of the bills. Oh, so cool. I met Phil. That's and awesome. And yeah, that was a treat because yeah. you know, I've been a fan of his for years. And very nice guy. So yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Dude.